front. We don't care. Plenty of minutes. Good evening. Welcome to the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeal meeting for March 11th, 2015. Could we have uh, a stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Could we have a roll call? Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Richard? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Stanhope, Mr. Loisel, Mr. Massisso, and Mr. Stark. Okay, we do have four members. Everybody needs to be authorized to vote. Uh, Mr. Stanhope, you're authorized to vote tonight? Mm -hmm. And you're already, Mr. Richard, you're already, you're not first alternate, you're regular. Yeah. Correct. Okay, good. All right, uh, let's start off with the motion for approval of the minutes from February 19th. Motion to approve. Discussion on the motion? Second. The second. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. 
And now we we'll jump right into the, we're going to change the order a little bit. Uh, the appeal number 2538 is practical difficulty variance by Kevin Coyne, 60 Ocean Avenue. They requested to go last on the agenda as he's out of town and will be running late for plans to be here. So with no objection, can I uh, move to that we move that item to last on the agenda tonight? I have a second on that? Second. Okay, any discussion? All there? That's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Let's roll right into appeal number 2539. It's a variance appeal by Joseph and Charlene Doherty. 16 Jones Creek Drive, Assessor's Map, U22, Parcel 08. And let me start with Mr. Longstaff, if you'd like to give us an overview. We'd appreciate it. Uh, I think this is want to have the applicant to give you the overview. And you want to give the That's fine, too, if you want to start that way. Why don't we go ahead and start with your state name then? Address. Absolutely. Uh, good evening. Mike Richmond, Custom Concepts Architecture, uh, here with the uh, clients and homeowners, Joe and Charlene Doherty. Um, keep this really short and brief because I have a nasty cough, and the more I talk, the more I cough, so please pardon my, um, my brief description here. Um, the Dohertys have, have found themselves in a kind of a tough spot, which brings us here tonight. Um, they purchased the property on Pine Point um, years ago, a uh, cute little bungalow, single story, um, with a lot of other single story structures nearby, um, and hired me probably a year and a half ago or so to say, we have issues with our home, please come down. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, went down, did a full assessment of the structure, um, and found that it is really in need of replacement. It was built in probably the 1930s, um, has mold, has dry rot, um, some serious structural issues that we looked at um, in various ways. So we went through this design process where we said, well, um, how can we address these needs? And the process uncovered a lot of other things that were deficient about the site and the property. Um, this property is on the back of Pine Point. It's pretty much in the, the mud flats area. Um, partially, part of the property is within the flood zone. Uh, the existing basement is extremely wet, extremely damp, which of course takes its toll on the structure over time. There's a well in the back. Um, underneath the deck, it's sort of a walkthrough, so it, it's allowed a lot of moisture to come in. <coughs> um, typical fashion with a, you know, with a house down there, the utilities are in the basement. Oil tank, um, Oh, electrical gear, uh, which is pretty much outdated. Um, a lot of indeficiencies in the structure. So my analysis to them and my recommendation to them was um, do not invest money into really trying to save the structure. Uh, the foundation, on the other hand, is in decent shape. It needs some TLC. I will definitely give it that. We need to fill in the hole in the back and whatnot to make it... Um, to make it safe, to make it habitable, and to try to take care of the, the moisture issues that's done so much damage in the house. So we went through a process of trying to come up with a way to remove the utilities from the basement. And although I don't believe we're required to do that by current code, um, we can all see the writing on the wall and we know it's coming. Um, you know, Superstorm Sandy is a great example. When will another one of those hit and flood that basement? The gear down there is old, it's dated, it needs to be redone. So we went through a process of saying, well, how do we get, if, we, if we're going to fill the basement in and do the right thing environmentally, how, what do we do with all those utilities? They need to go upstairs, somehow, somewhere. It's a very small footprint of a home. So as we did, tried to design the house with all those things that normally are in the basement upstairs, uh, it was too tight. It just wasn't even usable space. The walls are two by four. They need to be two by six. Everything just sort of got smaller and smaller on us. So we started to say, well, we'll keep the foundation. We'll keep the first floor. We'll reconstruct the first floor and go up. Great idea. We've done it um, you know, many, many times on Pine Point and elsewhere. Um, the dilemma with that is now you need a stairway. A stairway to code takes up quite a bit of room in a small house. So it just led us to go up and go out further. Um, not so much out of want or desire, just sort of out of necessity. So <coughs> the Doherty's actually commend them on this. They took a break. You know, we got this design going. They took a break. They said, we're just going to go uh, 
see if it makes sense for us to sell this property and buy another one. And they sort of disappeared from my eyes for months and went through this long process of looking at other homes. And I actually toured one of them to see if that was viable. Um, nothing made sense economically. It came back to me and said, uh, you know, we really think this is our best option. Let's move forward with this and see where this goes. So I've been in correspondence with Brian a, a few times on, you know, what can we do? How can we make this fit? Um, we went through a long process of trying to figure out the front setbacks, which we know are sort of possibly up for renewal um, from the town. But at, at least to today's standards, we're um, cognizant of where they are. So we ended up coming back with this design um, that we present here today. This design really is, in our opinion, <coughs> excuse me, a, a very reasonable approach to replacing a structure that has um, served its time and need to go. So in a nutshell, <coughs> what we're proposing is that we keep the foundation, give it a lot of TLC, fill in the openings, but literally fill it in with dirt as if it were in the floodplain, bring all the utilities up off the floodplain, up onto the first floor or even the second floor if possible. A very environmentally conscious thing to do. Um, it, it, what it does is it forces us in front of you to, uh, to ask for a variance. And because the site is um, a little bit touched, it's not much, but a little bit touched by the floodplain, um, I guess a practical difficulty is not in, in the cards for us, so this type of variance is the only one that we can even try to get. Um, as far as um, moving moving forward with it, um, you know, they've spoken to builders. They've done a lot of homework, commendable homework on uh, pricing and options, um, looking at elsewhere, looking at their home, and they really find this to be the most viable option um, that there is. Thank you. <coughs> uh, would you like to talk about it? <laughs> sure. Um, as uh, Mr. Richmond said, um, this would really be a better practical difficulty um, appeal, variance appeal, um, because of both floodplain, just a little bit of the floodplain currently um, is shown on the property, but the property is in shoreland zone, and um, almost entirely within the shoreland zone, we don't think that the structure is anywhere near the 75-foot no-build setback from the from the resource, but it is in, uh, nevertheless in shoreland zone, which disqualifies it from being able to be eligible for the practical difficulty variant. So now we're faced with the, a little bit tougher hardship variance, and that's the, the test um, that the uh, Doherty's uh, are going to have to um, meet. And as I said in my staff comments, um, you know, those are the that's kind of the line of questioning I think that the board has to satisfy itself that the the uh, Applicants or appellants have met um, those tests. Um, I, I do believe uh, that there was due diligence done on exploring the structure and, and assessing its needs. I think Mr. Richmond um, has done a, a very um, uh, detailed job of that. So I, I, I think everything that he's stated makes perfect sense from a structural point of view. Um, but. Now we need to find out if it truly meets the hardship test, and that's the tough, the tough part of this um, this variance. Um, other than that, I don't have anything to add. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Richard. Could you just explain the green and the blocks and what we're looking at there? Here that is. Yeah. So this particular zone, as as you may or may not know. Um, has a height requirement according to how far back you are from the front line. So the green line is a 20-foot setback. The blue line is 10-foot setback from the property line. So if I translate that into the building, um, this, this drawing here really tells the story. So if the road is out here, anything within 10 feet really should be 20 feet or less. Anything 20 feet back needs to be 35 foot or less. So in this particular situation, because we want to keep the existing foundation, we, we don't want to move that, the area of this design 
that requires the variance is this piece right here in pink because it's part of the structure above where the current house is now that's too high or higher than is what's supposed to be allowed up to that. Okay. And I understand from some of the town discussions that there's a, a discussion to move this line up here and therefore allow taller structures closer to the road, but I, I don't think that's been yet. Yeah. approved yet. Could, could you also walk us through uh, the, the first drawing? Could you just walk us through the, the is the black outline the property itself? Existing conditions. The dark dash line is the property line. The property extends way back, but I've zoomed in on the front part. The black is the current house, as is the current deck. That's me, thank you. Um, and I've added notation about wh how much this structure is already over the setback lines. You know, it's already there. We can't do anything about that. The proposed, these, these lines are the exact same. The property lines are the exact same. The front is the exact same. We haven't asked for anything different there. Even the overhangs of the house would all be all match what's there or be less. Um, and then the, the, the deck off the back. Why is the shape at the very back, right left-hand corner different? <coughs> Pardon? To the left-hand corner uh, right there. Yeah, that's different than the other shape. Yeah, this here, we, we, we struggled with that. That's a good question. The, the, the house isn't that big, and the only way that we could get the inside of the house to function even somewhat well was to move this mudroom sideways. As he turns it? Correct. Correct. Is it the same square footage inside on, a, on the first floor level, or is it larger? Or uh, very slightly larger. The only, actually, the, the bulk of the house here, exact same. This chunk here grew from this to this. I think, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, I think the amount of the house that's in the buildable envelope r remains the same. Correct. Um, the only difference is that part of that mudroom now is in line with the rest of the building sort of outside of the buildable envelope. Correct. Thank you. Um, <coughs> do we have any letters or phone calls on this? No. I'll open up the public hearing. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this issue? So we have no letters, no phone calls, no, no public. Okay. Let's come back to the board for questions, comments. Why don't I jump in with a with a few that I've got? Um, I'd like to just start with, with the, the, the toughest of the requirements, which is the land uh, in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance is granted. In the paperwork, I see that they've remodeled the garage. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And what you're telling us is <coughs> it's a $100 water bag, right there. <laughs> um, but we're uh, trying to get a handle on, obviously, the hardest part of that requirement, that's usually the most difficult with the variance, and uh, Mr. Longstaff is right, we don't have a choice but to use it because of the fact that part of the property is in the, in the, uh, flip, uh, the uh, uh, setbacks for wetlands. Do, uh, at this point, you're saying that this house, is it, is it the point where it's dangerous? Is it the point where, is it, is it viable as a, like, would you rent it out and not worry about it? No, you wouldn't rent it out. No, I, that's a tough question. Um, is it in immediate danger of falling down today? No, in all honesty. Um, but it cannot go much longer. Okay. And what are you saying about the mold? Uh, the basement is really moist. Um, there's a lot of mold. There's a lot of dry rot, which is scarier to me than mold. Um, and in the attic as well. It, it, it appears to me that the original structure was constructed with a regular roof, okay. and at some time they actually applied another <coughs> roof over it. You go upstairs, it's sort of a, a roof on a roof, and it traps moisture terribly. Um, it's tired and needs to go. I also think there'd be a fire hazard. Yeah, it can be a very big fire hazard, correct. Um, what kind of, how is it heated? Uh, it's oil. Where is the oil tank? In the basement. Yeah, which actually has been a very big concern of the Doherty's. Um, 
God forbid the water come up, which you know it will sooner or later, um, the way it's constructed right now, we'd have a terrible problem. Um, just for the record, I've had the experience of an oil leak in my basement. <laughs> Not a good thing. Uh, but is it environmentally an issue? If it le leaked, could it be an environmental oh, issue? Oh, a huge issue. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, this is not far from the from the marsh at all. Okay. So, as it sits, you've got a new garage basically repaired, remodeled. Made it look pretty. I think the expression is a little bit of stick on a pig kind of thing. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. So, is it your position that basically, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so let me, let me phrase that. What is your position on the fact that this has no reasonable return? Um, I guess that's a tough one to verbalize. Um, you know, the reality is this, it's time for the structure to go. And rebuilding the structure to what it is now in that small state within the community that it now sits does not make economic sense. The houses in that area, as we all know, um, have grown and increased in value. So for the Doherty's to invest X amount of dollars into it to rebuild what they have now wouldn't make sense. If they were to not do anything and lived in it for a year or 10 years and somebody bought it, it's a teardown. Have you, that uh, has tremendous bad value. Have you done any estimates of value per square foot? Uh, you know, if to construct it, what it would cost per square foot? We on the on the not on the new plans, but on the original, just making it. Yeah, we did actually. That was a good exercise we went through with the builder, although it was quite a while ago, so I don't remember the numbers offhand. Um, renovations did not even come close to making sense. The only viable option to us was to, was to rebuild. So from a a viability standpoint, when you look at that and the neighborhood around it, um, you know, there's a lot of nice homes around this. Um, to us, the only viable way to invest in this property is to at least be up to par with other similar newer homes in the area. Okay. Other than that, from our perspective, that's not worth the investment. And could you walk us through the two, you purchased this in 2010, correct? Could you walk us through what has occurred nothing more than experience, but what has occurred from 2010 to today to, to make it such a difference that now all of a sudden we, you bought it obviously thinking it would be okay, and I'm assuming you thought it would be okay, and now we're in a situation where you're saying no. How do we get from 2010 to today? Well, that's a good question. And, and if you want to take the microphone, just, if you go, Joe, come on up. Do you just state your name and address. And uh, Joe Doherty, 16 Jones Creek. Thank you. So my wife and I own the property. So what's changed really in the in the last five years is is just having been in the house and and, and being able to experience what it's like what it's like living there. So examples being that the basement over the last five years has has become worse as far as water. Every time it rains, water comes in the basement, um, literally surrounding the furnace. We do have a sump at the other side of the basement, but for whatever reason, the basement is sort of pitched over to where the utilities are. That's caused problems. Uh, one example would be last year, my parents were using a home, sh accidentally shut the furnace off, realized the next day, shut the furnace off, turned the furnace on, and the house filled with soot because of the dampness in the basement apparently caused an issue, right? So they had to call the, re the furnace people. It's just one example that makes it a challenge to use the home um, uh, on a regular basis. Um, the, yeah, the electrical has been an issue. So just normal use of a house with uh, you know, kids with iPads or televisions plugged in. Um, we're constantly blowing breakers. It's got old braided wire uh, electrical system. Um, so, you know, those are just a couple of examples. Uh, the roof leaked a little bit last year when we had some of the rain with the wind. Things like this that, you know, just make the property a challenge as, as, it, as it is in its current condition. Thank you very much.
board, other board members' comments or questions? Just, just having a tough time wrapping my hand around that new hardship. Okay. I mean, all, the, all the requests seem very reasonable to me. The way it's unfortunate it doesn't fit under the practical difficulty. I can't go that route, but the undue hardship, I just... Why don't we walk through the uh, the requirements and let Mr. Richmond walk through each one of those if he'll start. Uh, uh, Mr. Richmond, if we're ready, the, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless a variance in, is granted. And remember that reasonable return is a tough threshold. Agreed. I think to me we would just embellish on a conversation a moment ago that, you know, that they're faced with they have to do something. And in order to invest in something to get what they have now is not a reasonable return. Would not be a wise investment. I would have to tell them not to do it. So to us, the only reasonable way to get a return from this investment is to build something that's up to par with other similar homes in the area. Okay. Uh, B is uh, that the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property <coughs> and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Uh, ag agreed. I'm this, I think the original drawing here shows it the best. You know, what they've purchased, knowingly or unknowingly, is um, it's a really tight building window. You know, typical Pine Point lot. Um, but you can see how much of the existing structure goes over this line as it is. The 20-foot wide building window. Correct. Well, it's a single line. Okay. Uh, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character. I guess the, the, not, it should have, hopefully. The uh, granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the locality. I guess the hope is that it does. Oh, oh <laughs> absolutely would, yeah. I've spent a lot of time down there looking at that. And if anything, this would enhance it. And honestly, I think if nothing is done or nothing is allowed and the Doherty's are forced to not do anything or abandon it, um, that could be very detrimental to the character of the neighborhood. So granting this would definitely help us enhance the character. To that point, how close are the other properties to that other homes beside it? You know, did you do the measurements by any chance? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because if there's a fire, you, you mentioned the braided uh, wire. I remember those days back in the yeah. 80s. Yeah, it is. Fixing up two families. It's sketchy. Um, didn't physically measure it. However, if you look at ZB1, the bottom photograph, might help give an indication of that. On the left-hand side, there's plenty of space. Um, there's quite a large building on the left-hand side, actually. Uh, you know, two to three times the size of this building. Um, the one on the right is fairly close. And I think if we looked at the, the property on the right in the same method that we're looking at this, it'd be very similar. Okay. Thank you. And the last is a little, the hardship is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner. Uh, in, in our opinion, it is not. It's, it's, it's the size of the lot. It's the way the existing structure uh, doesn't fit within the existing setbacks, um, and the fact that they knowingly or unknowingly inherited a structure that is, uh, it's reached the end of its lifespan. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, just some comments to the board. I'll, I'll kind of jump in on this and say my opinion. We can go from there. I think it meets all the criteria. And A, the land can not yield a reasonable return the reality is, my guess is we are probably talking four or five hundred dollars a square foot to fix it the way they were describing it. I think the the equipment in the, in the basement is downright dangerous with electric and with oil. And having experienced an oil leak in my basement, which has got cement on it, I had the DEP in my house for six months with five gallons of oil. So I can tell you, they didn't live there. But uh, oil does a lot of damage. So I know that they, I, that worries me. Uh, it should worry anybody that would buy the home, and we know those homes in that area are pretty tired. So I personally believe that that does meet that requirement. Um, on the others, uh, D, the hardship is not a result of the action taken by the applicant. It's an old house, a uh, tired area. Um, B, uh, again, it's the property in my opinion, and it'll improve the neighborhood overall and keep it safer, and I like the idea that there isn't a fire potential. Um, well, there always is a fire potential, but it would limit to at least the current codes 
which would probably make the neighbors more happy. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm leaning. Uh, if you disagree or agree, jump in. I have a couple questions. Fire away. Uh, the proposal for the basement, you were going to fill it? Correct. Just make it a, basically a slab, thick slab. Yeah, I think the way that, uh, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, we've done it in the past mm -hmm. is uh, removed everything, cleaned it properly, filled in the openings, have a really big opening in the back, fill it all in, and literally fill it with uh, uh, a DEP-approved material mm -hmm. up to the same level as the grade outside. Now, with today's technology, is there a way to actually waterproof the existing basement the way it sits? Um, it, the technology exists. And I've done that successfully on a new foundation, but not an old foundation. Um, what they're what they're experiencing is hydro pressure, mm -hmm. which you know it can obviously come right through the wall during the storm surge. Um, it just comes up. It's the point. You know, it's all sand. So when it when that water comes up, it's coming from below. So on an existing structure, I can't even imagine how that would be done. Okay. So just the. To give you an example, so the back of the house faces the marsh. Under the existing mudroom entryway, whatever you want to call it, there's literally uh, an opening below ground um, with almost like a chute that comes from the backyard into that. So you sort of crouch down, you walk under this, and, and you walk out into the, the floor, essentially the floor. It's a small step down into the floor of the basement. My concern is in a flood, it's literally a chute that the water is going to come up the backyard and just rush into the basement. If you were to try to waterproof it, if you could even do it, um, you'd have to fill in that. And then the only access to the basement is at some point in this house's history, somebody cut a hole in an old closet floor and put steps down into the basement. So there aren't, there aren't even proper steps in the house. Making it more appealing all the time. <laughs> uh. Another question. Uh, I understand why they want to, you know, refurbish or rebuild. Uh, you've only owned it since 2010. Did you realize the situation? Did you have the building inspected and so forth when you bought it that these could be concerns when you bought it? Can you take the microphone again, please, so it be on the record. So, so at the, at the time. I, there wasn't this level of discussion around the floodplain changes. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly didn't come up in discussions with the inspector. The house was inspected. Um, nothing incredibly negative came back. Um, you know, the heater was working, the electrical was working, but there was no, you know, there was nothing negative brought up about well, you know, there's fire code issues or anything else. I mean, we had we had fire uh, smoke detectors installed, right? I think that was a condition of getting the mortgage, if I remember. But apart from that, we we knew that we were near the coast, so there was going to be a little water in the basement. But you know, my assumption was it would be infrequent. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out it's there. I was there tonight. It's, you know, earlier tonight, there's water on the floor. Um, every time it rains. So I, I guess you always expect you're going to run into issues when you buy a property, but it's exceeded um, um, well beyond what I thought. Okay, thank you. I'll add to that as well that my, my analysis when I'm trying to figure out, you know, to give an opinion, do you save, do you remodel, do you, I dig into things, that's when a lot of this comes up too. I, I would just clarify too, um, up on the screen, you'll see the existing floodplain, uh, uh, which doesn't touch the house. There's the house. Um, the proposed floodplain, just, just to kind of clarify what uh, well, Mr. Doherty was just talking about, if the proposed uh, FEMA maps were adopted today, this is what it would look like. The entire structure would be at a uh, base flood elevation of 13, which would require their lowest finished floor to be at 14. Um, they're probably nowhere near that now. So what that means is, although we would look at the house under today's standards, if they're going to invest significantly in the house only to have to find them below the floodplain, in, in future years, if these maps were adopted, it only makes sense to elevate the house 
to these standards or close to these standards as much as they dare or, or, or wish to. Uh, because we really don't know if this is going to be the number, but right now that's the best information we have. And so smart money would say if you're going to pump any money into renovating or rebuilding or whatever you do to repair the structure, you're going to want to elevate it. And to elevate it, they would have to come before the board, as you've seen many times, to, to raise that structure more than a foot above where it is now requires a variance. <laughs> okay, that's a variance. Even though the floodplain makes you do that, you still have to come to the board with a variance. It's, it's in a floodplain. <laughs> it's, it's this weird conundrum that our ordinance currently has, hasn't addressed and that we're going to try to address in the very near future to prevent that from being the case. But it puts anyone who wants to do anything close to substantial improvement to their properties in a position of having to come to the board to ask permission to do what the code says they need to do keeps us busy. So so I can't answer whether or not they meet the <laughs> hardship criteria, but what I can answer is it puts them between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> as, to, as the <laughs> saying goes. <laughs> so um, or a pond I don't pool. know, yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for a, uh, a, a constituent who comes to the office and says, what do I do? <laughs> you know, you can, which, the, which is the lesser of two evils? Um, so it's a really hard spot that not only the Doherty's but other folks have found themselves in uh, as well. I don't have the answer. It's, it unfortunately falls to the board to make those decisions, and um, you, you don't know. have to say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we do what we can do. We are taking steps uh, to, to try to address setbacks and things of that nature, which would probably help them a great deal uh, in the future how quickly they want to move on this project should the board deny this variance. Um, I don't know if they feel comfortable holding off for a year or two, but we certainly hope that we would have some amendments to the ordinance that might make this project more doable without need of a variance. We'd also hopefully at the same time address that conundrum of how do I elevate my structure to satisfy the, the flood plain management ordinance and not have to go for a variance at the same time. So, some of these issues might go away. I can't. I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't guarantee it. Thank you. So, this is the situation that the Doherty's find themselves in, and that the Board of Appeals finds themselves in. Thank you. And I can sit back and just watch it all happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Yes, sir. Should we also make note that whether or only four of us two-two is a? Yeah, just so you know, it's a two-two vote is a deep, is a fail that you wouldn't be approved. So you need at least three uh, members of the board. And uh, if we get down that path, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. But at this point, uh, just so you know, it requires at least three affirmatives. I do have some questions, too. Go ahead. Um, you made some comments about it not making sense to do it, wasn't viable, wouldn't be a wise investment. I guess I need more clarification of that. I, I live in Scarborough. My basement has water in it right now. I just took 20 gallons of water out of it. So, okay. I mean, I live there. I have to deal with it. It's part of where I live. Um, but I guess I'd want more information on why it's not a wise investment, why it doesn't make sense, why it's not viable, why they can't do something different with more in line with what the floodplain is requiring and also on the um, electrical is that knob and tube, or is that actually circuit breaker, or is it fuses? I'll let you take that. So there, there's a breaker box that was installed in the home sometime before I, I we purchased it. I, I'm, I'm guessing 10, 15 years ago. Um, the wires throughout the first floor, and the breaker box is in the basement. So for whatever reason, they decided to take the fuses out, put a breaker in, but that's literally all they did. The rest of the wiring on the first floor of the house is the original wiring, as far as I know. Um, and I've actually gone in and had to rework some of the outlets um, to upgrade the outlets, and, and it was braided when I, when I, when I did that, that work. Are the outlets grounded? I believe so, yes. Yeah, I, there was an electrician that did work at the house as well when we when we first purchased it. Yeah. Um, are they grounded? No, that's a good question. It's two wires, so no. I don't no, think no so. three prong. I don't think there's any three prong. No. No. 
they're probably, like mine were, they're probably grounded behind the box. Yeah, perhaps. Ground wires. Yeah, behind the back of the, the steel box. Yeah. Um, but as to your question about the, the practical difficulty, because when we started this a year and a half ago, it was, we really were just, you know, trying to fix a few problems. And then as we started looking into it, and the floodplain comes up, and then you've got the utilities in the basement, it, it sort of becomes, you know, bigger issues. And, and so when we looked at what it would cost to fix and address the, the environmental piece with the basement and the oil tank, a little bit of water in the basement, I agree with you, in and of itself isn't an issue. Uh, the fact that we're close to the marsh, the fact that any kind of a flood event is going to flood that basement and hit our, all of our utilities in the oil tank. And if I were to just fix all those things, um, it's a pretty substantial investment to bring the property up to a modern standard. And at the end of the day, if I go to sell that property, whether it's five years or 10 years or 15 years from now, it is most likely that somebody's gonna buy that, tear it down. They're gonna view it as a tear down. Just like every other property, when we bought this property five years ago, it was one of the, it was one of many single family, you know, small, less than a thousand square foot properties. They're virtually all gone because everybody that buys one tears it down. So for me to try and recoup any investment I put in that beyond the fact that I get to use a nicer house, um, I'm not going to get the monetary return when I go to, to sell that property because it's, it's going to be viewed as, you know, again, too small a tear down. And, and, and then we haven't even addressed the fact that moving the utilities upstairs is going to take what's already a small footprint and, and take even more space away from, from the living area. Other questions? I'll throw a couple out, uh, just a couple of quick ones here. Uh, you mentioned the handicap accessibility. Uh, is that? <laughs> yes. Uh, um, so if, if we're going to invest in the property and, and fix these things, we wanted to just make sure that it was, it was something that we could enjoy right, into our retirement. Right? So it makes sense to try and have hallways that are wide enough to put a wheelchair in. Um, it wasn't anything beyond that. That's smart. Yeah. I get it. Uh, and uh, are we going over the, flood, the current floodplain? Do you know what the foot is? But, what the height is, is it oh, 17 feet or whatever? We, we have, I think there's an elevation study in, I think in the packet you were given, we had Probably an elevation is. I guess survey the, done. The question, I guess, is are you going above the floodplain by a foot? Y yes, yes, I think That's it's closer rule, to, to a couple, couple, maybe even three feet. Okay. The current level of the, f the first floor of the house, so if you fill the basement in, it would become up to code with the proposed more stringent flood map. Right, very good. Uh, other questions, comments, or motions? Well, now where you have, where you're going to be filling the basement in. Correct. Is that going to be, I mean, is there anything been looked at on that from the way the water comes now and the way the projected floodplain is for that basement? That's built well, then to move and the house shift? One thing that Can Brian and I discussed there? a while ago is that if we're going to do this, that we possibly put in flood vents anticipating that someday it'll be in the flood zone and or let's just do it right, um, even if it's not required. I'll ask, what's the flood zone? It allows the water to move freely in and out of the basement. It's really only required if, if, the, uh, if the floor is below uh, the base flood elevation. Just so so if your adjacent just grade is already higher than the flood elevation, you're not required to put flood vents in. Some people do. It is it no different than an air vent, or is it, it, it a slap or whatever? Yeah, it's it's a kind of a. They're they're designed to allow hydraulic pressure to push them open, mm -hmm. and then it flows through and pushes the other one open, so water can come in and can move out <laughs> without being impeded. Uh, there are products on the market. Some people build their own. Um, but it's just, and it's, they're sized based on the square footage of the area that they've got to drain. Good. I assume. Ba based upon height, would the property to the left, what would this property look like compared to that one as far as height? 
Excellent question. If you look at the drawing ZB2, uh, the photograph in the upper left-hand corner, I honestly never went over and measured how high that structure is, um, but that's a full three stories plus a roof. So I anticipate that this structure here would be considerably lower than that. That's a, that's a tall building. Is there anything behind this building other than the garage? Uh, the Doherty's? No, just the marsh. What I'd like to do, if there's no other questions, is I'd like to um, move that we approve appeal number 2539 uh, as requested, but I'd then like to go through the findings of fact, if everybody, depending on the outcome, uh, and uh, uh, make sure it's on the record from each member. Uh, so I've got a motion on the table for approval. Do I have a second? second. Discussion on the motion? Okay. So. Uh, second by uh, Mike. Uh, so, at this point, uh, all in favor of the motion as requested? One, two, two, just two. Okay. And opposed? Two opposed. Okay. Um, at that measure, uh, I'd like to come back with another another motion. Uh, is, is there a motion that either of you would be acceptable to that allows them to do something? Or I'm really worried about the, the environmental impact. Um, is there something that's, that is stopping you from being comfortable with that? Uh, it's it, it's the, the first question where reasonable return it is. So I don't know if that's been completely answered. I understand why they have to do it, and I understand by putting it more to code, you're doing a lot of things that are correct. You're doing a lot of things that will benefit you and the neighborhood, obviously. Um, electrical, the, I like the compliance with ADA and everything. So even though it's not a business, I still think that's a wise move for going forward. But I, it's just tough to wrap my hands around that, especially with the understanding that there may be something coming up that may allow them to do this without <coughs> us having to approve it. That, that may, may or may not happen. Yeah, that may be a risky maybe. Yeah, but I mean, we are looking at a property that was purchased in 2010 and 2015. I think it still could yield a reasonable return. That's my... Agreed. I have the same issues with the reasonable return. And, you know, right in their answer, the existing two-bedroom seasonal cottage is, it has inadequate sleeping accommodations for the Doherty family of four. That really we don't change or, or go against an ordinance because of someone's sleeping conditions. Um, I understand, but, uh, and plus, you know, it was bought, purchased in 2010. Uh, a lot of the issues were there when it was purchased. Um, down the road, like Brian said, it, it could be uh, changed without a permit, without us, you know, uh, given a, a variance against the ordinance. And that's basically how I feel about it. Like the third, so I actually made a mistake, and I need to own this. Normally, when it's a 2-2, we give the applicant more information and an opportunity to, to come back with more information if, it's, if it doesn't look good. I violated that standard that we've actually set over the years. I would request, uh, because of my error, that we allow them the option. That I'd like to, to vote again against the motion allowed taking this off and letting them have the opportunity to do the homework like we would any other applicant and come back. To the, I, that's the chair's fault that did that, and I, I, I feel responsible for that decision. Would that, would, does the board members, especially the two that are would they be okay with giving them that option? So what, what are you suggesting? I'm just giving them an opportunity. The motion? Uh, let's vote it on. So but I'm, what, what I'm saying is I made a mistake. Under normal circumstances, I would have said, we've got two and two. Let people vent it. I honestly, to be candid with you, felt pretty comfortable when I when I walked through it, so I didn't expect it. Um, I'm okay with what you believe in. I uh, no complaints about that. But I think they've had an opportunity to hear, hear us, and by being able to table it and letting them come back and then restate uh, the issues or try and f define the issues you're worried about, that would give them the opportunity to do that. And like I said, I own that mistake, and I, I would like to give them that option. 
So that, that's why I kind of mentioned that the 2-2 two, two would be... I didn't catch it. <laughs> I, I should have caught it when you said it. So and that then, you, then you knew that if we voted 2-2, two to two, it was not going to pass, and that would be it. But you do have the option normally if we vote 2-2 two to two and it doesn't look like it's going to pass and it's going to be in your favor that you can table it and come back so you don't have the fail. Come back when No, you could... Well, no, it's not a matter of the... Yeah, it's not a matter of how many people... No, I it's, what the what the, what the test is typically, and, and this has been standard policy, is that when we have something that's close, um, we give the the applicant opportunity to hear the arguments. We hear the ar arguments. You hear our arguments back. You go back and try and readdress those issues if it's going to be close, because you can't come back for a year after with unless it's with anything other than a, a different appeal. I violated that standard. That was my fault. And so, as chair, I'm taking ownership of that. I do believe that because of our standards that have been applied for as long as I can go back, I believe they should have the opportunity to go back and readdress these issues that you have. Absolutely agree. You've always given them, if it looks like a 2 2, it looks like you, you've given them the option. I would like to comment again on the criteria about the hardship and how I feel. I, I do know that that's their situation being only 2008 is a moving target. Brian knows that these these floodplain maps are a moving target. Um, storm surges have been on the increase in the past 15 years. We know we have an issue at hand here, and I can see how their issue has evolved, meaning move in, everything seems great. Next thing you know, high tides, storm surges end up in the basement. It's a little bit scary, and um, I think they've adequately explained the undue hardship on themselves with with the cost it would take just to repair the existing and at the same time moving utilities upstairs, I am in complete agreement that does create an undue hardship. And I will also say that it, it's a tough one for me because it's just, it's just such a wide range of interpretation of that. It's not black and white to me. It's very gray. But I do think that Mr. Richmond did a great job in explaining, and, I, and I'm... And I'm fully on board with that. I think it, for them, I can see the moving target. I can see how it all evolved, and I can see the need to, to make these changes. But you can't be, you can't overinvest in this property. That would create, in my mind, an undue hardship. And I can see how the cost, the amount of money that these folks would spend on this small footprint without having the ability to expand in itself is that would create that undue hardship. So that's, that's, that's where I stand, and that's for the other three facets for that, for the criteria, I think they've adequately met that as well. So that's... The only one that can overturn a vote is the people that voted against it. So it would be requiring, if you wanted to overturn that, you'd need, one of you would be, need to put a motion that we overturn it and let them go back to the table. And that's I, I wouldn't vote to overturn my decision. No, not overturn your decision, but overturn to allow them to be able to come back after doing homework. I'm, I'm fine with that, and I don't know really how much more homework you folks can do. You've done quite a bit. I, one of the things that kind of caught me was that when the inspection was done, there was really nothing that came up. Had there been something that had come up, had your inspector notated that you've got a roof upon a roof, you've got electrical that needs to be taken care of, you've got water coming into the basement that is a hazard for the utilities and also is a hazard to the environment, that would have allowed me to possibly change my mind because I would have seen that y you had an inspection that told you things needed to be changed and you were coming before us because of that. It wasn't just five years later and you were just coming because we've got all these moving targets now with the floodplain and everything else. That would make it a little bit easier for me if there were issues when you folks were buying it that were brought up and that were presented or something that you could present to us that shows rapid deterioration over these five years that is just unrepairable. Before we, before we, I'm, I'm sorry, it's really a conversation with the board at this point. Uh, I, what I heard from you, though, is that you would allow it, you'd vote to... You'd allow them to come back, yes. Okay, so we've got, is that in the form of a motion? I can make a motion to... He, you can't, only he can. You uh, yeah, I would make a motion to give the applicant a chance to come back before us and present any more information that they could to help us understand the circumstances a little bit better. Are you okay with seconding that? I'll second it. All right. All in favor of allowing to remove the last vote uh, and bring it back and allow them to table if they choose. Uh, say aye. Raise your hands. So, uh, four. Would you two please take some time to address uh, Mr. Richmond about your concerns so that 
I think they're important. I, I think I have. I, 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 yeah. It's okay. I just want to make sure they're on the statement. Would you like to add anything else to nope. your statement? I think uh, we covered it. What you know, our, our feelings are or in, in doing the uh, work and the unreasonable return. Uh, Mr. Richmond, do you prefer to have this table? I'm assuming yes. Well, it, is it possible to have a, a little more discussion on that? Because I'm afraid that if we did table it, we would pretty much sit at my office and, and spin and just not know where to go. Um, uh, my advice, I'll give you my opinion. Yeah. My advice is that you really need to address uh, number one, uh, A, in as great a detail as you can um, to, to, to get enough people to say, well, we understand that this property really has no value. Uh, I would argue that the, what, there's a lot of different things. What will move them, I don't know. But because I, I had already felt it met it. So what, the, I, it's not my job to change their minds. Uh, they've given you the luxury of correcting my mistake, and I certainly appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, if I, could yes, sir. I could offer a couple of suggestions I think that might satisfy, or not satisfy, but would address your concerns as perhaps a market analysis, some, some market comparisons mm -hmm. by an appraiser or a, a broker uh, with knowledge of property in that area. Uh, that kind of comparison and analysis might start to start to get at some of the questions and concerns that you have. I'd also um, suggest or offer, and not to appear biased in one way or the other because I have no dog in this fight, um, but just to kind of offer an interpretation of reasonable return. Um, in this case, the Doherty's bought a property. It was a dwelling. There was a dwelling on it. They brought bought the property with the expectation of being able to use that dwelling as a residential structure, to live in it, to enjoy it, as anyone would expect to enjoy a home. A little different than if you bought a lot with no structure on it and found out that you needed to come to the board for a variance in order to put a structure on it. That's a little different deal, because you bought a vacant lot, you must have, you must have figured there was some kind of return you could get off that vacant lot. They bought a structure. They expected to live in that structure. So the unreasonable return is that they're not going to be able to enjoy that structure in the way that anyone else would expect to enjoy a dwelling, with mold, with water in the basement, with all of the, the various issues. If, if the floodplain ordinance is adopted as is, they're going to have to, if they do any of that work, it's going to be substantial improvement. They're going to have to come to the board for a variance anyway to do that work because it's going to trigger that. So I just offer those thoughts. Um, it's a little bit different um, test when you start talking about unreasonable return, okay? It, it doesn't have to be the most return, but a, what is a reasonable return for a, a property with a single-family dwelling on it? You expect to use that property for a single-family dwelling. If the building's falling down or it's not safe to live in, then you, you're not able to realize that return. I, I offer that up. I, I think that's what Mr. Longstaff is kind of stating and what my opinion is, is I need some legitimate statements or proof that this is going to be uninhabitable, that the mold is going to create a problem, the roof is going to create a problem, and it's not going to be a structure that can be lived in. If I had more information on that, I may be inclined to think about it differently. Uh, so would you like to table this? As well as fire as well, because we do have fire hazards. You talked about a hallway going down in the basement. Yeah. Those types of things, addressing with the fire marshal, a statement from the fire marshal that he thinks that's a fire hazard. That should be remedied. You've got to walk backwards down the stairs. Get me some hard proof from the people that are saying you can't inhabit this. That's well defined. Or I mean, you can inhabit it. Right. Say, say. I think Mr. Longstaff's comments were basically you expected to live in it. And if they're coming back and saying this should not be a building that's lived in because of the, these fire safety issues or these mold issues or the fact that it's just going to float away with the new floodplain if you had a flood. I mean, those types of statements from folks that can legitimately qualify those statements will make it easier to justify that question for me. Fair enough. Uh, do you want this tabled or not? We'll bring it back at the next meeting if you're ready yes. for it. Yes, please All table right. um, Move to the table. No discussion on that. All in favor? Unanimous table. And I would just check with the fire department and check with the chief. They may be able to give you some information about your walkways <coughs> and things like that and your electrical that may be 
something that's proved. Uh, so just, I, just, I know it's probably too late for this, but just so all of you know, um, they did take the time to share this plan with all the neighbors, all supportive, including uh, Chief Carson, who lives right across the street. And one of his biggest things was, yeah, it'd be a much safer place. So probably too late for me to state that. But you well, said we, that, that's, that's why we, that's why we table. And, and again, I, I need to thank the, the dissenting members for the courtesy and um, the respect of my mistake. And I apologize to the board and to the applicants for putting us in that spot. Thank you for allowing them to come back. I think that was generous. No problem. I have something to say, too. You know, I, I understand, and, and I, I commend you on your presentation, and I understand why you want to in, improve your property. Everybody, all your neighbors and the whole town wouldn't mind, but we're bound by an ordinance, and that's that's how we our criteria is. And, and in order to grant a variance, it, it really has to prove undoubtedly the, the hardship criteria by the ordinance. And uh, I think what we've said on the board here, uh, you can present a little bit more and so forth. Uh, it, it would probably help us a lot by you know make an exception to that ordinance. Uh, maybe in the near future when these things start coming up, because we've been having a few of these here and there, planning board might be able to address this and, and make it a little easier on property owners in, in your position. Unfortunately, we have to look at it le legally as to what we're bound to come up with our statements. Mm -hmm. We have to satisfy all those. It's not what we may feel personally, but right. it's what we need to justify for the town and for... And if I just one more question for the dissenting members. Any of the other criteria bother you? No. No. Thank you very much. Thank you. All okay, right. Next item. Thank you for your time. Uh, appeal number 2539. It's a variance appeal by Joseph and Charlene Doherty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the wrong one. I'm jumping down one. Appeal number 24, 2541. Limited redu reduction of front yard size by uh, Nathaniel Zilka. Two library lane, Sessions Map U19, parcel 44. And if we have a representative there, we'll just give you a second to get things. Yeah, I didn't remember the owe that money on that water. Um, I got it. <laughs> uh, if you could just state your name for the record. Sure, my name is Trevor Watson. I'm acting on behalf of Nat and Sarah Zilka. Okay, Mr. Watson, uh, in uh, legal capacity, in what capacity? Uh, I'm the uh, architect and the builder. I work for Eider Investments. Thank you. Which is a construction company on Black Point Road. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, Please. so a brief overview here. Uh, as Brian noted, we um, uh, came for a variance to relocate the existing structure, uh, the, the existing principal structure, which is in the upper left-hand portion of the, scre of the screen. I want to note that because it benefits my argument in that prior to the relocation, uh, you can actually see in, well, in your packet, well, you can probably see it, the, um, the existing house is over the property line. Uh, so the lot really doesn't conform to modern property lines. So the um, Zilkas are, are currently asking for a reduction to be able to uh, move the swimming pool, reduce the front yard setback along Seal Rock Road from 40 feet to 30 feet, a reduction of 10 feet, to give them a little bit uh, more room and to utilize the lot uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more conventional and sort of expected manner. So the, the four points uh, that I want to just briefly go over here, the, the existing lot is very rare in that it's burdened on three sides by a front, front yard setback. Uh, this effectively, if you go to page three of the packet, this effectively reduces the ratio of the legal building envelope to total lot area uh, to about 25%, which is about half of what you would expect in a, in a you know, a quote unquote typical lot in this area. The the second point is that it's even uh, rarer still to have a lot of this size, about 24,000 square feet, uh, which is typical for this zone, for this area, uh, to, to be burdened on three sides by uh, a front yard setback. You would expect that um, 
you know, from much larger tracts of land, in which case this wouldn't be an issue because your legal building envelope would be far greater than 25% uh, of your total uh, lot size. The, and then the third and fourth issues are kind of go hand in hand. The sort of current existence and natural topography of this lot, the, uh, uh, the sort of existing plateau, uh, and then the dense and uh, sort of natural or old uh, uh, vegetation further limits, uh, you know, and, and not impacting that, impacting that as, as, as little as possible, further reduces the sort of area available to you to install a swimming pool. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that uh, Seal Rock Drive is not 66 feet wide. Uh, you know, it's, it's a one and a half lane road. There's zero expectation that it ever will be uh, a much wider road than that. And, and currently and in the future, because no one's going to move it, it uh, favors the Zilka side of the property. So their 40 foot front yard setback in reality is much closer to 80 feet from where the public will be traveling. So that's sort of the general overview. Uh, if we want to go through the packet, it's uh, basically uh, you can see the uh, I'm, I'm displaying the swimming pool with the 10-foot front yard reduction along Seal Rock. You can see, uh, sorry, it'll be plus or minus 76 to 80 feet from where the public will be walking. Additionally, the pool is elevated up. And so, uh, you know, people aren't, it, it's going to be very hard to discern that there's a, even a swimming pool there from the public. So the impact will be very limited. Uh, and you can see sort of the burden of the lot. It's just a very unusual size, uh, unusually shaped in that it's very long uh, and narrow, 60 feet uh, at its narrowest. Um, so that should I do, do? You want me to go through the? Why don't we stop there for a second? Yeah. It's a long staff. I know some uh, comments. You can give us an overview, and I'm sure the staff you read the staff comments, but it's long staff. Sure. Um, it, it's kind of an unusual request. I don't know in, in my short tenure here that I've seen a limited reduction of yard size request for a swimming pool, but it is an accessory structure uh, by definition. Um, you know, it, it qualifies. The residence was there prior to. 1993, and, and just because they're moving it to make it actually exist on the lot, I don't think ruins that criteria. So um, as far as the request goes, it certainly meets the criteria. Uh, it's up to the board to determine whether or not, um, you know, they've met the burden of proof as far as meeting, meeting each standard that they have to review. But as far as the request being eligible for this type of appeal, it, it is. Um, I probably told Trevor at first I didn't think it would be, but as I explored the ordinance, there really is. It does actually fit. In my uh, defense, you say that to every one of my yeah. variances. <laughs> I do, actually. I try to talk him out of every one of them. But, uh, but no, it, it's the proper, I think it's the proper tool. I cannot, certainly can't instruct the board as to what they think about the, uh, the, the standards that need to be met in order to, to rule in favor of this, uh, this appeal. Could, could you help me in a clarification regarding the, for instance, my understanding is that the patio is not an issue on setbacks because it's That's not true. Yeah, they're indicating a dry laid pool patio. It's not a structure. Um, it's, we consider it landscaping. That can exist within the setback. Uh, the request is, if you look at the, the map, is it's actually just for the pool structure itself because it's an in-ground pool, it is considered a structure. So is yeah, above ground pool. Yeah. Uh, above ground pool is also? Yeah. yeah, yeah they're, they're considered structures. Um, and so although I would, I would probably and did argue with Trevor that, that it could fit within the, the very limited building window, it's about the only thing on that lot other than the existing accessory structure that, that could fit in the, in the uh, window. He raises some issues and concerns with removing vegetation, the existing forest that you see, I'll try to move the cursor, that you see at the bottom of the property and that extends over here, that moving the pool into that area possibly could mean the removal. Obviously, you don't want trees overhanging your pool, so there'd have to be some vegetation removal, stumps, uh, roots, that kind of thing. 
So there's some disturbance there. I think the location he's proposing, probably less disturbance, probably goes a little bit better with the grade um, uh, that, that exists. And I guess there's a retaining wall here that sort of this works a little bit better with. But, you know, again, uh, just from a geometrical standpoint, it could, it could exist in the building win window. Um, so I guess that's where the board's questioning needs to, you need to satisfy yourself that um, this makes the most sense, I guess. Okay. Uh, we don't have an elevation uh, chart. Yeah, do we? Uh, we do. I'll scroll to it if you want. I don't know if it's an elevation, but if there is a... Uh, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't have an elevation. This is just the, the section through the pool itself. It'll be... Uh, the pool deck will be about four feet below the the plateau, which is in the <coughs> lower left portion uh, of the big flat grass lawn. It'll be about four feet down from that, and it'll be about six feet uh, above uh, Seal Rock uh, Drive. Okay, I'm sorry, you lost me there. Seal Rock's on the right. So if you travel right. in a diagonal motion from the lower left corner to the upper right corner. Oh, okay, so it's, it's grading. It's it's a, so if I'm looking at the accessory <coughs> structure at the bottom of that. Sure. If you go in the lower left-hand corner to the left of the accessory structure and to the, the below the principal structure. Go over to the right for me, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Longstaff. Right there, yeah. What, is that grading down? Is that yes. grading up? Is that a knoll? No, that, 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 is, uh, that grade is down. So, that so if, if, down. if uh, Mr. Longstaff, if you create an arc, from where your cursor just was, up and back to the, to the principal structure. Exactly. To the left of that, to, the, to down and to the left of that, is the highest point of the lot, we, if we consider that zero for all purposes. So this is high, this is low. Yeah. I'm sure where you're getting. Yes. High, low. Okay. This is high, <coughs> grade slopes. Exactly. And high would be zero, low would be plus or minus, minus, uh, uh, plus or minus negative uh, 10, 10 to 11 feet. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Trevor, right in here, is this a steeper slope right in this area? That is actually a retaining wall that we uh, installed so that the accessory unit could so have So the grade's a, higher here? No. And lower lower where the pool I, is? I apologize. This is my fault. I didn't, okay. I didn't provide enough information. Don't, don't let it happen again. Yeah. So if we go the upper, the, the lower left hand corner, Yep. You can do me a favor. Could you grab the microphone as you're doing that, just so it's on the record? Thank you. <laughs> if you go from the existing retention, if you go up and like this, exactly, that is the break point where the grade steeply uh, sort of drops off, drops off down to the elevation of Seal Rock Drive. So there, it really is a plateau. It, it's quite steep. It, it's it, it's a it's a plateau up onto the lawn. So what you're saying, if if I may, what what you're saying, Trevor, is if this pool was brought in this direction, it would be into the slope a little bit more, uh, and and out of the plateau a little bit more. Uh, no, it's all low. Okay, it's all low down. So everything below this existing retention wall is basically on the same. Yeah, we're going to create a second plateau okay. that is four feet below the uppermost section of the lot and six feet, uh, uh, six feet above Seal Rock uh, Drive. One of the one of the reasons is for privacy. The second reason is because that entire lot is ledge, and uh, by elevating the pool up, we can uh, we can both provide privacy to the public on Seal Rock Drive, but also for the inhabitants. Uh, for, for Nat and Sarah Zilka, and we can limit the amount of ledge we have to remove. But I will note that if we do drop it down, we'll have to remove a lot more of the trees. And if I might add, the the one of Butter, uh, they have a swimming pool uh, 15 feet off their property line, di you know, directly down. How's that relevant? Uh, it's, it's relevant for... Uh, uh, it's relevant for the reason of item number uh, two that it's reasonable to expect uh, a swimming pool as a uh, uh, y you know the installation of a swimming pool in this specific area. Okay, fair enough. Um, anything else, Mr. Okay. 
Uh, do we have any letters or phone calls from us? I'll open up the public. Anybody from the public have any desire? None? I'll close the public part of the meeting and go to the board for questions, comments. Should we go through the questions? Or? Uh, do you want to do that first? Would you rather do that or you want to start I, with questions? Yeah, I usually give you an opportunity to discuss and then go through the questions. If there's none, we'll go right through the questions. Okay, so why don't we just start with number one, the existing buildings or structures on the lot for which the limited reduction of the yard size is requested, erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant, non-conforming lot of record. And if you could just answer that. Yep, that's please. correct. The, the uh, town website lists the um, structure built on or about 1900. And just for clarification, we actually, they actually came before us once before and relocated this property, right? That doesn't eliminate their right. It's still on the, it's still there. Okay. Uh, the request of reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or the occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. And that speaks to the point I just, uh, uh, the, the reference I just made to the neighbor, to the single abutter. Uh, they have a swimming pool. We're putting, we're installing more and more swimming pools in this community. Uh, so we feel it's reasonable to ex uh, have an expectation of a swimming pool. We're merely asking for relief on the uh, burden, the, the uh, rare and uncommon burdens that impact only this lot. Is this a second home, or are most of the homes are second homes? Yes. Primary residence? Yes, this is a summer home. Okay, it's a summer home. Yes. Okay. Uh, due to the physical features of the lot and/or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. And my guess is that's probably going to be the hardest one. So if you could spend some time on that. Sure. Uh, th this is just basically um, d due to the. Uh, the, the three front yard setbacks due to uh, the odd ratio, uh, basically the, the, the natural shape of this lot, which is very skinny and very long, uh, due to the, the natural topography of this lot uh, and due to the existing vegetation of the lot, all of that sort of comes together within the legal uh, building envelope. And so we're asking for some relief to be able to move it into uh, uh, what we believe to be a more reasonable uh, location, a more, re uh, a more reasonable location that, that will not uh, have the same impact, uh, the, the, the reduction of the front yard will not have the same impact as if the it, it road were, uh, uh, let me, I'm sorry, uh, Trying to figure out a, a good way to say this. The, the, the existing location of Seal Rock Drive is such that the 40 foot setback, even with a reduction of 40 feet going to zero, you would still have a 40 foot setback to the public areas. So the 40 foot setback with the 10 foot reduction to 30 feet from the property line still presents a plus or minus 75 foot setback to the, the public publicly accessible areas of the, in relationship to the swimming pool. And the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on existing uses of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts of, effects of building or structure which conforms to the life size requirement. That's correct. Even with the conformity, uh, e even if building this swimming pool in the conforming uh, legal building envelope, we would be elevating it. Uh, we would be treating it in the exact same manner. Uh, the only, uh, and furthermore, the cr creating privacy by elevating it up uh, above Seal Rock Drive. Um, and the, the, the front yard setback going from 80 feet to 70 feet will be imperceptible to uh, the public. And the applicant, you have not started. No, we have not. Uh, again, I'll come back to the board for questions or comments. I have some questions. Sorry, I'm not sure. um, one for the pool. I can't tell on the plans. It looked like there was mention of fence, but is there going to be a fence around this pool with a locking gate on it? Yes, absolutely. There'll be a four foot high uh, safety fence uh, encompassing the 
you know, effectively uh, blocking the children's access or, you know, whomever's access from the, from the swimming pool. And for the third question that the chair referred to is probably going to be a one that was going to be difficult for us. Um, why can't it be practical, or is this just an economic or vegetation or erosion decision to move it, as Mr. Longstaff has suggested, to the lower grade of the property? Absolutely. One of the, I mean, the, 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 two, the two real issues are the existing vegetation, creating a privacy screen. Uh, it's, the vegetation is nice to look at. Uh, it's old. I mean, it's as old growth as possible in Prouts, you know, in the community, which was once cleared as farmland. So this is, you know, this is not. I, I don't know if it's technically accurate to call it old growth, but it is. They are very old trees, which would have, which would have to come down if we were to install this. The second reason is the benefit of the single butter, whose swimming pool is on the, you know, the 15-foot side yard setback for him. So it, the 10-foot buffer would. The, the the ten foot additional buffer would provide some additional uh, privacy, some additional you know noise protection coming through the coming through the two tree you know coming through the existing vegetation. Now, is any of the vegetation on the other property owners' property? Um, there is very limited. We in doing all this work on the lot, we've discovered that the you can see in the uh, uh, towards the Maybe middle right of that. the screen. You can see that they have they have uh, burdened Nat and Sarah Zilka with having the privacy on on Nat and Sarah Zilka's property by extending their yard all the way to the property line to their shared property line and in some case and in in some cases over their shared property line. I think it disappears. Okay. Is it was that is that. Should I, do you want me to point to it or can, can everyone see that? No, that's fine. I was just wondering if the impact of moving it more into the envelope would impact by trees that would have to be removed, a neighbor having to remove trees that were rooted or what, what may be where they, the pool would be constructed. Because of their swimming pool, the neighbor has low-lying uh, brush, not necessarily uh, tall trees. Okay, so it could be put there without really much of an impact. The, it would it could be put there without much of an impact on the neighbor's lawn, but the trees that exist on Nat and Sarah Zilka's property would have to come down. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, other members, comments, questions? No, no questions. Okay. Uh, what, just to get a sense of the board, how is the board feeling about this, the issue of the pool and the location? Uh, again, it's two to two, so I want to not make the same mistake I made last time, even though I was warned. <laughs> well, I, th I think the application has been presented well, been explained well, uh, and I understand why they want to set it where it is due to the impact of the neighborhood, the budding neighbor especially. Uh, tearing down those trees really probably isn't a great idea as a buffer. It's probably a great buffer, natural. I don't think it's going to impact uh, any other properties putting it where it is and utilizing the land of what they, they have instead of, you know, taking down the old trees and so forth. Uh, could you make the pool a little smaller? Possibly, but then it wouldn't be a standard size pool. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think uh, they presented it to me to be able to prove it. Mr. Longstaff, do we need to consider the fence around the pool at all, or is that part of The fence is in the structure as long as it's six feet or less, and that can exist in the, that can exist in the right of way. I said that. Our typical installation, sorry to interrupt, our typical mm -hmm. installation is to bury it within vegetation anyway, so it's not it's as minimally visually impacting as possible. Mr. Richard, would you like to make comments on uh, I think you did a nice job, Joe. I agree with Mr. Stan Holt. Uh, yeah, I'm inclined to vote for. I'm familiar with that property. I walk around that quite a bit. I, I can see the challenges. 
you're up against up there on that with that terrain, but I know it seems to seems to satisfy the satisfy the criteria. Mr. Crawford. I, I would agree. It seems like if there wasn't another neighbor in the direct vicinity that didn't already have one, I may be more inclined to look at it differently. Okay. But and and the fact that they're taking into account the buffer and we're really not impacting the neighbors and the measurements are being made to do that. Very good, thank you. We I'm always consider some, that. Some concerns about the whole concept of the because it almost sounds like the pool is going up instead of down. Yes. But it's not going up as much as the the buildings or the the high plateau. It's it's going if you would consider uh, 10 feet, which would probably be the elevation, the, the height of this room. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 feet would be the high point of the lot. That is the lot that the that the structures currently exist. And at this elevation, where we're standing now, we would be the visible elevation from the street. And if you step back, if you went 80 feet that way, and you envision a, 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 a six foot tall man standing there, you would have a, you'd be very hard pressed to see what has happened on the other side of that. What about drainage? How does this, by doing this, because you're really changing the topo to, uh, excuse me, topography, what about drainage? Has that been factored into the equation and where the water's run off? Because you're, what, you get only about four inches of, of uh, loam or whatever, then you go to um, uh, ledge, don't you? You've only got a few inches of ground before you hit ledge. Sure, so uh, currently all of the, it seems as though all of the water in Prout's pools uh, in the northernmost point of this lot. So we're not uh, changing. The, the, the ledge is such with the high plateau, all of the water runs off. We've not done any drainage studies because we don't really ever do drainage studies because it's a, a rock. Uh, and so as such, it just sort of all dissipates and goes towards the, the ocean. With a good filtration system, it could be a sedimentation pond. Oh, you mean you mean drainage into the swimming pool? Yeah. Oh, I'm just being. <laughs> well, can you wait until I get the approval? <laughs> just on if that. I get it, because we're going up on this height, do you have any concerns about um, drainage onto neighbor's property or onto the road? And no, I think that they're retaining enough vegetation. As he said, all the water basically gathers up in this area anyway. So yeah, there is a storm drain too at cool. the intersection of. Uh, uh, Winslow Homer and Seal Rock, uh, I, which I believe it is um, a public storm drain, and there's a private storm drain uh, to, 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 in an attempt to mitigate the, the pooling that I just described uh, directly across the street, ac across Seal Rock Drive. Okay. What I'd like to do with uh, the board is just go through these items, and if each board member could just make a position on each one of these, that would be great. Uh, the existing buildings or structures on the lot, well, I guess that's fairly understood. We'll all agree that number one. That would be great. Uh, on that. Number two, the re 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 uh, requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties that utilized in the zoning district. Now, we said that Would you explain what, if, why you agree? What, what, what's the logic behind your reason? Well, due to the fact that, like the uh, presenter saying that most of those properties there have swimming pools or at least the abutter and probably more. Uh, they're just, you know, setting it up the same way as the typical neighborhood. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Richard? Same thing. Yeah, I think, the, I think it's very reasonable for the, the homeowner to request having a pool coming here as a summer home. There are, you know, a lot of pools down there, more and more being built, obviously, down there, but uh, it's a reasonable request for something coming here for three months or whatever it might be they come for. Mr. Crockett? I would agree. Same. Uh, three, uh, due to the physical features of the lot or the location of the existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion and larger a new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. I'll step down here again. We do discuss, okay? Uh, as uh, they presented earlier, the buildings have been there for quite a while and so forth, so they're going to utilize, you know, available space and uh, from the study they've done, it's the best location, I believe, possible. Yeah. Mr. Richard? Yeah. I agree. The same logic is that. 
just for clarification, Mr. Chair, what were you on number two? Uh, did I jump on? No, we had said why. You oh, oh, thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I'm a little bit more uncomfortable with number two, uh, but it is a summer. It, it's a place for summer. Right now, I don't believe there are a lot of pools there, but, but I, I, I get it. And if I were if I were to want to be a summer location, I'd want to, I would either want a lake or a pool or something I could swim in. That cliff's way too high to jump in. I, I think it's pretty high cliff. So I get it. So I guess the bottom line is I'm, I'd say okay, but uncomfortably, but I'd be okay with it. Getting the concept that is really a second home community. I, I would agree on three as well. And uh, the, the fact that they basically have made the measurements to try to protect the neighborhood and keep the neighbors' privacy at a max. Can you walk me through why we have to go for the full 10? Uh, yeah, it's interesting that that you, you took the maximum of what's allowed there. Is there a reason why you couldn't go 8 to 7 or 5? Or, or is it just where it sits is where it needs to sit? Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I wish I had a reason, but 10, you know, 10 is, I wish it were 20, but 10 is the the maximum that we can that we can draw from, and the the weight, if if I can use that word, it, the 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 distances are far uh, more heavily weighted towards Seal Rock Drive than towards the neighbor. So your argument is that not only would you want 10, but if you had a way, you'd, you'd take. I would. I would an eight. You'd go 12. Yeah, I would want. I would sure. want to go 15 or 20 to try and to try and get it as centrally located as possible between where other people are going to be. And I, I get that. I uh, the impacts and effects of the enlargement expansion the building is, is in the neighborhood will not substantially be different from or greater than the impact and effects of the building or structure which conforms to the yard size. I'll start that again with you. I don't know. I just really don't have an excellent answer for that, but... You know, it's okay. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's you okay know. to not have an excellent answer. Right. Uh, we do need to put something on the record for it. But right. I, th I think his answer, um, what he answered was uh, quite, you know, self-explanatory on, on uh, the swimming pool 30 feet from the park line versus 40 would, would be better for the public themselves, you know, that where he's placed it and so forth, so utilized a lot. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richard? Yeah, it seems to be the only spot that makes sense to me, knowing that lot. I would agree with the same statements from the other board members. And I would also. Uh, number five, you have to you have to your work so they cut off the table. Okay, so do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. So there's a motion to approve appeal number... 2541, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, 2541 two as re as represented. Okay. Have a second. Janet. Second. Okay. <coughs> All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a practical difficulty variant by Leighton Farm Subdivision, Elmwood Avenue. This is map R57, parcel 1B and 3A. My editor, it's good to see you. I thought I'd give the same call as. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that way I put you up there. Just long. I can't talk very well, so. Great. If you could just state your name and address and your position. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Sean Frank. I'm an engineer with Sebago Technics out of South Portland. I'm here tonight on behalf of uh, uh, Vincent Maeta uh, and Leighton Farm LLC. 
Uh, before you, we have a conservation subdivision design for what was the Leighton Farm subdivision. Uh, this is a project we worked uh, many months, actually years now, uh, with the planning board. Uh, I don't know if you if understand the process from a subdivision, but you start with a, a concept plan, if you will, which is just the, the standard subdivision, i.e., our two lots, 100 feet of frontage, 200 feet depth. If you have a certain amount of wetlands, uh, basically you have to go to a conservation subdivision design. The whole point of that is to retain the wetlands and any other natural features on the site as much as possible in their existing state. Um, worked with the planning board, uh, came up that we all agreed that they agreed that we could have 99 lots out through here uh, on about approximately 80 acres. Of that 80 acres, 45 of it, if you will, will be retained as open space and a good swath of that uh, conveyed to the town of Scarborough. Uh, access, the existing access we have is actually under construction right now is Owens Way, which intersects with Elmwood. Uh, there's 23 lots in association with that first phase of development. Um, and again, that's been final approved and has actually been, uh, is actually under construction. Is that Ron Owen's memory or is that? Uh, it's actually uh, Owen, <laughs> Owen Leighton. <There> you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> we try to keep everything. We have Leighton Farm Road, all keeping it hopefully from a historical perspective. Okay. Uh, the, again, the subdivision requirements in the uh, town of Scarborough for road acceptance is that you can't have more than a 2,000 foot dead end. Uh, 2,000 feet probably gets us down and around here. So the only way to access the, a big majority of the developable area down through here is to maintain a second means of egress coming off from Elmwood Avenue. This is where we had proposed it, again, in association with the, our preliminary subdivision application uh, to the town and to the planning board. Uh, part of that also was going to the main Department of Environmental Protection and the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for wetland impacts and stormwater management. As we were going through the review process for preliminary uh, planning staff, Notice that we, and you know, and we all know it anyways, that there's a tower here that FAA has had on site since 1973, uh, obviously prior to any ordinances in association with tower placement. So obviously we're not asking to place a new tower on the site. The fact is the tower is there. Uh, the tower is about 140 feet tall. Uh, it's approximately located about 95 feet uh, from this uh, easterly property line. Uh, by the creation of this roadway from the town's perspective, uh, we're creating a new property line, if you will, the right-of-way line associated with the roadway, uh, which means that the setback from the tower, which under ordinance right now would be, need to be 140 feet, is currently 95 feet, uh, minus another 50 feet, we're talking approximately 45 feet uh, from the tower uh, to the actual right-of-way line. Uh, so we are asking for a, a practical difficulty to allow us to be able to install the road uh, to allow us to get to the back of the property, because obviously without being able to develop this in accordance with the zoning provides a, a major economic hardship. Um, we won't have any lots proposed within that fall down zone, within that 140 feet. It will just be um, uh, the roadway itself. There is one lot uh, that is here now, uh, but will obviously be taken off for any future subdivision plans brought before the, uh, before the planning board. So that lot in the corner there is, is no this one right here. That's correct. That's that should be, would be removed from, it. again, with the full intention that once the tower is no longer needed, I think the easement's through 2017 right now, Ben? Yeah. 16. So hopefully within a year or two years that, you know, the easement is no longer, then we would go back to the planning board at that point in time um, and allow us to get whatever lots are available at that point in time. Again, the whole point now is to allow us to get this road going so that we can start doing the rest of this, because right now, again, we're limited to just be able to go 2,000 feet from that one roadway coming down through here. This is just simply allowing you to <coughs> drive a, put a road To put in, the roadway, in the roadway right of way within the, the fall down zone. In the fall down zone. And I'm not even sure any other the fall down zone. I, I, yeah, we were talking earlier about the, what is the point there? They basically have the fall down zone as 100% 100, 100 of the tower height. Uh, so again, in this case, it's 140 feet. Uh, you know, uh, we did talk to planning staff and obviously met with a, a code enforcement officer and appreciate their assistance through the process. Uh, there is a, an, the, only, the only other option to that, um, and I think I provided that as part of my submission to you folks, um, again, is they certainly want to maintain the, ex the entrance across um, Green Acres Drive, is to maintain 140 feet around from that. The problem is, is that basically puts that road right through the wetland. Uh, the wetlands that the whole conservation subdivision design standards are, are designed is to minimize that impact. Not only would it be difficult to go through the subdivision process through the planning board, 
It also means back to DEP, back to the Army Corps of Engineers, because obviously, you know, their whole thing is to minimize the wetland impacts. That's conservation subdivisions on Army Corps of Engineers, DEP. That's rule number one is always minimize. So obviously our first step was to come to you folks and ask for some relief and association to allow that road instead to come along uh, where we would have it. Um, hopefully, like I say, the easement goes away in a couple of years. Uh, no lot to be proposed there. Uh, it would just be the roadway itself. Again, just as we were talking about it, you know, uh, the tower is there, the road's there. I mean, is that any worse than a utility pole, perhaps, within the right-of-way? You know, a tall tree within the right-of-way? Uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of things in the town of Scarborough right now that can fall down across a, uh, uh, a travel way. Uh, and obviously, there is a second means of egress out in terms of once this road is connected to be able to go back out in case there ever was a, a catastrophe, if you will, in association with that. Um, I do have, obviously, my application, so I'll be happy to go through uh, individual items. We will in a second, but thank you. Thank you. Um, anything to add, Ms. Lawson? Uh, no. Um, we met, uh, discussed the situation, felt that the practical difficulty variance was the appropriate avenue to request relief. Um, I think Mr. Frank has described the situation pretty adequately. It was kind of a something that the tower had been there so long nobody even thought about it <laughs> until we kept looking at design standards and said, hey. Is it even used? Is uh, it active? What's that? I, I don't believe the tower is active. Well, my understanding now is it's specifically utilized by the uh, Federal Aviation as, call it a fixed point, uh, that it's, you know, from them coming in from a radar standpoint, that's one fixed point on their radar screen. So. Right, from a triangulation standpoint, like that type of so thing. But, on but it's certainly not, not the VOR it's that. certainly not the tower that it was when they first put it up back in 73. Okay, just kind of curious. Um, uh, let me open up the public hearing. Anybody, nobody here to speak to it? Uh, any letters or emails or anything on this? Nothing. Okay. We'll close public hearing. Why don't we go through the uh, Perhaps the difficulty variance requirement, and we'll go from there, okay? Certainly. So the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. And this is actually a reverse question, isn't it? Because the, the, it's not your property that's the problem, it's the tower that's the problem. What's well, the fact that the tower is on the property, I think, is the uniqueness of it, and the fact that the tower has been there for 40 some odd years. Because I think usually you see these, it's the other way around, because we right. be asking to put a tower in. I'm sorry, Vinny, Vincent Mayetta, I am the developer for the parcel. Just to be clear, uh, I actually own the property that the tower is on. However, they have a lease for a few more years, um, at which time uh, we're, we're going to hopefully not have to renew it. The, <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it, but they're trying to, the FAA right now is trying to investigate a way to put that tower, the purpose of that tower, on the facility at the Portland Shepport and eliminate it from this site. So we're very hopeful that that's going to occur um, so that the tower will be, will be gone and this won't be an issue. But we expect that we'll probably be building a road in through there before their lease expires. So mm -hmm. that's why we're here. Is there an is there a access road right now that... that, that there there is a tower. Does that road connect to any of the things you're doing? It, it, it doesn't, no. It runs yeah. parallel with our new road, but to the left of it. Okay. <coughs> you look at the screen. Oh, thank you. Like you'll see. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Um, the, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of a budding property. I guess we'll find out, right? Well, and again, from our standpoint, the tower's there. I mean, usually it's, you know, you're adding a tower to a site. Um, the tower's already there, so certainly that'd be the detriment. Uh, this would be the development to a residential neighborhood, which we think would only add to the value of the neighborhood, so. And the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. And again, it was, it was established in 73 prior to, you, you know, the town of Scalbra actually having a tower ordinance in place. And no other feasible alternatives to the applicant except for that means. Uh, and again, the only feasible alternative is actually going through the wetlands, which is a very, from our standpoint, and I think from the planning board standpoint, and the Army Corps of Engineers standpoint, the main department of environmental protection standpoint, is, uh, is not a practical alternative. 
and the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. That's kind of a tough one. But. Well, from our standpoint, again, we'll be developing the property. By allowing the variance, the, the, the property gets developed into a residential subdivision, which is what the whole surrounding property is, is residential development. So we think it'll be totally in keeping with the, uh, the surrounding properties. And uh, the granting of variance will not have an ad unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment? I think it's the exact opposite. By granting the variance, it'll actually uh, allow us not to have uh, an, an adverse effect on the natural environment. And that's not in the shoreland zone, correct? Uh, the, the variance oh, is not yes, correct. Okay. All right, I want to come back to the board for questions, comments. Um, quick question on number four. The current access road, is that within the floodplain, I think you mentioned the current access road that no, within the wetlands. Right no, actually, within the wetlands. That's what I meant. And I apologize. And it is funny because, and more than likely, maybe the creation of that road might have led to some of these wetlands when you write down to it. Again, here's the access road, if you will, coming to the tower. Uh, here's a small wetland right here, and here's the big wetland right in through here. So the road, the actual access road itself, is is obviously not wetland because it's been built up. The wetlands are pretty much on either side of it. So that's why it's not feasible to use that existing road? Uh, we can't use that existing road, that's, that's correct. But again, the other part uh, in terms of the location of this road is obviously, again, from the town's perspective, is we have Green Acres Avenue coming off from Elmwood. They want us to align Leighton Farms Road, obviously, as close as we can with that intersection. So rather than having an offset intersection, it's as close as we can to the intersection. Other questions from the board? It's pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, nice job of explaining everything I thought. Pretty straightforward, definitely. Um, so just uh, quick, I'm not going to belabor the, the items on this because it's fairly basic. But the board could just chime in as they feel appropriate. The needs of the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general condition of the neighborhood. In fact, it's, it's, it's the yeah. turn of that. It's the opposite of that. The tower is actually creating it. Doing this takes the tower out of compliance, in essence. I agree. Okay. Uh, granted, the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Uh, it's the opposite again. <laughs> Uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, the only thing I'd qualify that on is that somebody could make an argument that since Mr. Maeda leased the land, you could argue that it was his, that would be a piece. I don't buy that argument um, because it's, it was 1973 prior to the, the ordinance being in place, which I think is only probably 10 years old, maybe 15. The, the tower ordinance? Yeah. Uh, Certainly, after the yeah, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, I would, I don't think you know, somebody from the 1973's decisions to today. Mr. Chairman, if I could, I mean, actually, towers wouldn't be allowed there today. So <laughs> it would be a non-conforming, <laughs> it's a non-conforming existing structure. It, it wouldn't even be permitted to be there today under the current ordinances. So great, that helps actually. Uh, the, uh, no other feasible alternatives available the applicant accepted variance. Well, feasible is an interesting word, but I would argue if we don't need to disturb wetlands, mm -hmm. exactly. it's not going to make that much of a difference. And it does either way they could do it. So I'm sure it, it's probably was it, what level of wetland is that? Uh, it's, it, it's, it's it's the headwaters to a small stream, which obviously goes down to the Nunsuch. So you know, again, it's just it's it's a contiguous wetland. Yeah. You, you could probably get it approved that way, but it would be all the process would start all over again. Hey, the process would and the, the expense, and, the, and again, and obviously, to be perfectly honest with you, my first step would basically have to be a letter from you folks saying, no, the variance isn't granted, so that, you know, because if not, they they wouldn't even allow me in the door, to be perfectly honest Fair with you. Uh, the granting of variance will not result, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the granting of variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. In essence, again, that's kind of a flip. Uh, the property, putting the project in actually makes the, the tower a non-conforming but it's not even allowed, so that's kind of, uh, it's not in the shoreland zone. So uh, do I have a motion for uh, approval of the new, or deny, whatever anybody wishes to do? Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve appeal 2542. Second. Okay. Discussion and motion. You know, all in favor? Thank you very much. Well, thank you much. Yeah. Hey, we see you folks on up a long night tonight after all. So.
No worries. Thank you. Uh, there was supposed to be one more person coming on uh, appeal number uh, 2538 by Kevin Coyne, 60 Ocean Avenue. I would move that we move that to first on the agenda next month as he's not here and then there isn't a reasonable way for him to have contacted us. Oh, here he oh. is. <laughs> oh, okay, very well. Can you just sign that? He made the motion, so you okay. so <laughs> no, don't yeah, don't don't second. That's <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, I don't know where you're going to try and place it. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to unhook to do it. Um, so, what you're going to do, you should be able to do it right from there. Anybody want a mint? A mint? Yeah. Do you guys want one? Sure, I want one. Okay, thank you. I think she thinks we have bad for us. Just taking a second. We're not trying to go offline, but just taking a second to get the two to shut up. You gave us six. You only gave Mark two. I think my wife doesn't want to do that. Thank you. 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 Choose the du duplicate. No, duplicate. See those pictures. <laughs> issue most of I think the concern was regarding the separated garage and we also talked a little bit uh, after the after they tabled it uh, which is customary uh, to sort of suggest I, what might be intriguing to us or may make me more sense and be more consistent with the ordinance and so Mr. Coyne if you could just take your record and my name is Kevin Coyne 60 Ocean Avenue thank you and if you'd like to give us an overview of what you've done since the last time we met, and we'll go from there. Yes, I've uh, updated the um, site plan to pencil in a uh, garage, but I'd like to find maybe a mutually agreeable <coughs> dimension for a garage and location. 
So the first thing I did was uh, attach the garage to the house. But, um, so in this sketch, you can see uh, I have a couple different variations. Yeah, that's so, kind of with perspective yeah. there. Is there a point or a okay. Well, okay, so the, one, um, the first question in the last meeting was uh, the dimensions um, of the setback. It was um, my drawings were done by an architect, and he made the dimensions to the walls based on the, uh, the survey. So I added um, an outline of the building to show the existing overhang. So, to so that, that secondary outline is, is in the same footprint as original? That's, that's what existed, But it's yes. the overhang. Yes. And that consists yep. of just dropping a straight line down. Yes. I think that's great. It's a one inch, I mean a, a one foot um, overhang throughout the house. Because that, as we mentioned, as you not indicated that, it would have caused you problems later yeah. on. So I'm yep. glad that it's good. So um, based on the, the site plan, um, I put a layout there for um, a 16 by 20 foot garage, um, even with the front of the house. So looking at that, the, the main sketch, the, the the dark, is that that's the current footprint? Is that correct? Yes. Top, and then is it the lines that are down there a little bit lower? The yeah, garage? the yellow lines show the side side walls of the garage, and the front of the property is to the right. What are the three lines that come? Okay. Like so the the first. Um, line would be um, attaching a 16 by 20 garage to the side of the house. Okay. Um, the next would be a 12 by 20 garage. And um, the third proposal would be to um, put a garage so the corner of the garage meets the, the property setback line. That's a third line up. Mm -hmm. And But um, to increase the building envelope to include the small square between the, um, the front of the house and the garage. Okay. And I would I would make that the garage. So why well, should you bring that even? You would square that off. That square would, off the front of the house. Front of the house. Okay. So that way, I, um, you know, from the side, I'd meet the setbacks from the side, and the corner of the garage would meet the setbacks. Good. Thank you. Um, the, is that clear? Uh, I think on you that? did a good job explaining it, Mr. Uh, Do you want to add to this or what's the initial? The pictures we have. Don't show the three choices. It only shows what appears to be two. Is that correct? Uh, we have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is this is completely different. I mean, it, it's uh, completely different than what was presented, and it for discussion purposes, it's fine. The board, uh, you know, the appeal was for specific distances, and so. Mm -hmm. It's not generally acceptable to come with a multitude of choices. You kind of need to come to the board with a request. And so I'm a little confused by the multiple choice options here. Although it's great for discussion purposes, um, it puts the board at a little bit of a disadvantage because now you're basically saying, which one of these would you, would you approve? You know, we've already advertised the the appeal for a specific um, request, and now it's you know um, it's just very <laughs> confusing. I guess. Okay. Well, um, the site plan submitted um, after our last meeting has two of those three dimensions here. It shows the. Uh, 16 by 20 garage and the 12 by 20 garage penciled in. Um, could you? I don't have a 12 by 20 garage penciled in. Uh, I don't. I don't know what you're. This is what I've. This is. This is what you submitted. Yeah. So that would be. You know, this is a. I thought this is a dimension line. Oh okay. uh, Well, it's, can you? Can if you're if you didn't know what you were doing and you looked at that, would you, would you be able to tell that was two different? Options? No. <laughs> okay. Just, just wanted to point that out. Apologize. Right, this is what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the same thing that you have. So it's, it's, uh, it doesn't say two different dimensions. 
two different garages with two different options. Oh, okay. Um, so if the camera wants to get a shot on this, just be able to lay it out flat. Okay, so also in that submittal was uh, this dimension sheet where it does describe that. It says uh, the proposed attached garage, and it lists a um, 16 by 20. Um, 16 or 12 foot wide garage, the bottom, and the dimensions for that are included in this table. So there are two choices here, but three there? Yes. And uh, the reason I proposed the third option was um, the write-up on the, the summary, that the executive summary that you receive. Um, it stated the uh, proposed layout would cover like over 20% of the property. Correct. So I thought if, if that's an issue, you know, I could go with eight foot wide from the side of the house and just build on that little square between the... Um, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Chair. The third option where the town has already advertised the appeal based upon the information that we had for the, the 16, I mean, it does show it on here with two dimensions, but I, I don't think we can truly consider it the third option at all because it was not part of what was oh. discussed to the public or presented to the public. Would you agree, Mr. Longstaff? Uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's the lateness of the hour, but I'm looking at the, the new cover sheet that you gave me. I don't see two options for a garage on there. I'm completely lost. It says dimensions B3 and B4 are for the corners of the garage, which is to be either, oh, to be either 12 or 16. Yes. Okay. Was I thought it was going to, I thought it was, I was reading that as 12 by 16. Yep. Was this in the original package? Uh, this was in his... Amended pack. Yeah, we put them oh, after you table last time. Okay, but sufficient. It's not that we. No, no. no this, yeah. this is what you. I mean, I've got what you have got. I was just reading it. I, yeah. I, I wasn't taking it as as an either or kind of thing. Now, does the twelve My foot? Does the two things of fault issue? Does the twelve foot? You may not know this off the top of your head because of this conversation. Does the twelve foot make us <coughs> come back in line with the the twenty five? Coverage is that work? Well, 25 percent is that right? Sorry. I factored the coverage based on a 16 by by 20. T what was the uh, length of your garage? 20. It doesn't say it, but I measured it out. Yeah. And found it at 20. <coughs> comments basically the twenty percent. I, I can just speak for myself. Whenever we're doing something like this, it, expanding it is outside of the envelope is automatically a challenge. Then to go beyond the twenty percent scope is really to me a challenge. I'm not too worried about it if it were kept in the twenty percent personally. But I don't know which I don't know which one of these examples fits that category. That only reduces the the one seventy eight the 178 square, excuse me, the 178 square feet of area that you would be over on the 20 20 percent that gets reduced by 80 square feet if you go with a 12 by 20 as opposed to a 16 by 20. So you'd have to go to almost seven feet, and then that's not including this area here that's going to be filled in on the yeah. plan. Yeah. So that leaves you 18. Here's my thoughts that's real quick. That's not right. 178 minus. We're, we can't be doing math like this. 98. Um, here's my thought with the board chair chime in. I would not approve anything more than the maximum 20% coverage. I personally do not have a problem with the garage if it met the 20% attached to the house. I would, I would personally be okay with that. That being said, I don't know whether or not filling in this chunk here takes <laughs> gets us right back to the same problem because we don't know the math. Because you're not taking, Mr. Longstaff, you didn't take that into account, correct? Uh, no. I, I, yeah, I didn't understand that to be a, I didn't understand that to be filled in. So I, I, I think we're right back. I, I thought I understood it. Now I don't. <laughs> Here would be my, my advice, <coughs> and again, if the board doesn't agree with me, feel free to jump in, but I think the best thing to do here is, again, table this, 
come back with something that fits the rules as best can, which would basically be within 20%. And uh, I think the attached idea, which we came back with last time, was something that all of the board felt would be an important piece. And I don't, uh, so I think that's good, and that's very good. But I think you need to deal with the 20% issue okay. for coverage. Uh, but we can't really vote on this based on, uh, I don't think it's a problem uh, to, to your comments about uh, announcing it because it's smaller. But that being said, um, we, don't want to, we, we've, we learned our lesson about redesigning on the fly. And so I personally don't think we should be redesigning. We should be seeing what we're seeing. Uh, so that's kind of my position. Do the board members have a different opinion? Yeah, I would have to look at it to be exactly what we're approving. I don't like the fact of three options and that it was not conveyed, whether it be smaller or larger. I'd like to have the actual dimensions on here, so we're not trying to have to figure out what that is. Okay. Uh, in Mr. Coyne's defense, we, I think one of the board members last time he was here did kind of say a feasible alternative would be connect the garage to the house. So I think that's what he's trying to do. Uh, I think too many choices. Uh, come back with what you want and, okay. and try to get the variance. You know, a 12 foot wide garage really isn't feasible in my mind. I mean, what, what can you do with a 12 foot wide garage? Going 16 like you have here might be over the limit somewhat, but at least it's a, a usable garage. Uh, but if you have something more solid, just one, you know, option, this is what I want to do. Okay. Due to your land uh, boundaries and so forth, it, it would be in, taken in consideration, but have it solid, and then, uh, you know, I think we could work with you. Okay. As far as I'm concerned on that, just to give you more feedback, again, I'm one of the people that felt it needed to be connected. I'm glad you did that. Thank you. Uh, however, uh, covering a car is different than a garage, so it could be a carport. It could be a variety of different things, but I still think personally to be consistent with what we've done in the past with lots like this is when it, the goal is not to use up more of the land that isn't there. So if it were me personally, and I'm only one vote, I'd want to see 20% and uh, whatever's feasible based on that attached, which I think you've done. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And, and I can tell you based on that, I would vote yes. Okay. But I don't know what the rest of the board is, even wants to get that detail, but that's where I'm at. No, I, I would agree. I would say within the 20% would be easier for me to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I commend you for attaching it because unattach, unattached, I had no way of yeah. really approving that. There okay. was no way I would be able to justify that. I'm not saying I would vote yes or no on this, but I would like some precise measurements and some some information just showing that it's within that, if we can get it within that 20%, that would be ideal. That's what we've generally looked at in the past. Okay. That's fair. Mr. Richard. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking of creative solutions, too. I think that, um, as Stan Hope said, if you're going to have a garage, I think 14 feet is the minimum. 14 feet works. It's not ideal, but it works for one car. And, and maybe somewhere, maybe somewhere just, just getting back. So essentially from 16 feet to 14 feet, you, you've eliminated, you've gotten 40 feet closer, square feet closer to the 20%. Maybe looking at the original structure too, maybe redesigning that might not even be a bad suggestion where he could swap out some of that coverage for the garage if the garage was important to him. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. That's fair. And I'm sure Mr. Longstaff would uh, work with you as much as possible to give you exact numbers on what you have proposed to bring to us, and then, then you know, it would be solid. Yeah, and um, I should mention, to be fair, too, um, I think one of the counselors last time asked me if that was going to, if the garage was going to exceed, and I think I had miscalculated because I, I thought it was, it was close, but it wasn't over, and when I went through the numbers again in the interim between tabling last time and bringing this up, that's where I discovered the, the that it was over by 178 square feet, which isn't a lot, but on that small lot, it's a big yeah. chunk, just okay. the same. Mm -hmm. So it kind of put it, it did put you at a disadvantage because I, I thought you were okay on the square footage, and then it, in reviewing the new plan, it wasn't. But um, 
again, I think now that you've explained some things, we might have some different ways of addressing that, that overage that would still get you more than what you've got as far as an ability to park a car. Okay. Um, and it may be just a car, you know, not, not a two car or not a yeah. car and a half, but um, it might get you what you can live with um, potentially if we can stay on that. I think the board's made it pretty clear that with the square footage, or with the uh, lot coverage issue addressed, that everything else seems to make sense to them. So I think we're we're closer than we were last time. Okay. I very strongly recommend that you do work with informed staff because it'll, it'll save you a lot of it. I think we might have it the third time. I, I would suggest strongly that a carport might be the best solution to get you there because if you, especially if you want to use that spot. But again, if you're within line and what you're showing and we're in the percentages, you would get a yes vote from me. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll put that on the table. Um, so in, based on that, anybody else care to make any other comments? And if you have the right to table this, I would advise you to do that. Okay. But you need to make that request. Yeah. Uh, one question for the next meeting. I would like to table it for one. And the next meeting, um, is a site plan sufficient for our discussion, or do we? I need full elevations. Ele elevations as far as including a garage. Drawings. Yeah. Um, What you're really coming to the board for is is a request on on setback setback variances. Yep. It's helpful to the board to have more information. It's not necessarily a requirement, but I think you need to be relatively sure that you can do what you're proposing on the site plan. So you need to at least do enough work from the building design point of view. And rough sketches are fine. Okay. Um, it, you don't have to have the entire floor plan worked out inside. It's not their job to determine if the floor plan is uh, is okay. But you need to satisfy their um, curiosity about can this actually work. Okay. So you have to do enough work on the building design to be sure that you know you're not going to turn around and come back with a different request once you find out you can't build what you what you. That would be on the worst case scenario is that you haven't done the homework and you actually, well, like the issue of the of the eaves, you don't want to be in a situation where you start building because now all of a sudden we've got a problem with, you, you've started building, so now it creates a whole different set of options. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, uh, there's, and there's no problem, if, I mean, if, if, you need to, if you need to table it for an extra month, I know it puts you at a different time of the year maybe building, but mm -hmm. in order to satisfy you and the board that you can do what you want to do. Take the time you need to figure it out. Okay. You want a uh, table for the next meeting, which for the following meeting? Oh, uh, the next meeting would be better for me. We'll put you first on the agenda for the next meeting. Okay. And uh, let me move. Actually, we haven't both moved. So we've got, I'll move that we table this item until the next Second. meeting. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Unanimous. And I will just say, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I will just say for me, the more information you can give me, the better. If you can give me some height and some dimensions, that that makes it that much clearer to me. So whatever you can give us, I mean, we don't want you to. We're not trying to be design everything, but we would. I, my own personal opinion would be, the more information you can give me to present your case, the easier it makes it for me to look at it and make an informed decision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Joining uh, member comments, any joining board member comments? Given the lateness of the hour, um, I was going to approach you with <laughs> with some uh, some other um, items, but I think I'll save those for the next meeting. We'll see how the agenda shapes out. Okay. Okay. The suspense will kill me. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. <laughs> going to knock your socks. <laughs> Ah, no, you really kill it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's uh, worth waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. We're adjourned.